My name is Chris Williams, and I'm the Assistant Director of the James Farmer Multicultural Center here at the University of Mary Washington. <laughs> Thank you, <Ron. laughs> uh, First, I would like to welcome Senator Tim Kaine. Mayor Mary Catherine Greenlaw. <laughs> Vice Mayor Chuck Fry. <laughs> the president of this wonderful university, Dr. Troy Pano. <laughs> Esteemed guests, UMW professors, students, city staff, and members of the press to the unveiling of Fredericksburg Civil Rights Trail. I can't even begin to describe to you what a fantastic day this is for the city of Fredericksburg. That's right. And the University of Mary Washington. And more importantly, to our black community. Yes. Today we are going to share with you phase one of the Fredericksburg Civil Rights Trail. Before we do that, I would like to invite Mayor Mary Catherine Greenlaw to come up to the podium to say a few words. Thank you, Chris. I'm truly honored and privileged to be here today on this very happy day. I would like to recognize my fellow counselors who are here, Counselor Devine, Counselor Kelly, and Counselor Gerlach, I believe, are all present this morning. This is this is a priority, a very important goal of your city council to tell the whole story of Fredericksburg. We are very grateful today because of the collaboration with an important player in our history, the University of Mary Washington. Thank you, Dr. Pano, for creating a partnership and a culture where your students are encouraged to engage with the community. It is a very valuable partnership for this community. And we thank you for the use of this beautiful facility this afternoon. <clears throat> the important work of the Civil Rights Trail was actually part of the curriculum of certain classes here. That's how engaged and how close the relationship is. But I especially recognize today with great appreciation the members of our community who have shared their stories, given their oral histories to us, to enable us to know the history of Fredericksburg. Beginning in 2017, we here in Fredericksburg tackled a difficult issue. We have a corner on which stood a sandstone block in front of a building where slave auctions were known to be held. It was popularly known as the slave auction block. The city council with the assistance of the International Association of Sites of Conscience, led the community through 18 months of small group forums, talking about that block and what to do with it. And the wonderful thing is that people came, hundreds of them, and that they talked, and that they listened to each other. And the real result of those conversations was not in what to do with the block. The important result was that we recognized that this historic city has so much more history to tell. 
the contributions of the enslaved Africans and their descendants, and so many citizens who contributed as we as a city and America as a nation tries to live up to its promise in the Declaration of Independence to be a more perfect union. We did move the bar. We moved it to the Fredericksburg Area Museum. But more importantly, we determined to tell the whole story of Fredericksburg. And we have dedicated funds and even additional staff to that effort. As philosopher Alice Thayer McIntyre once observed, you can't know what to do unless you know what story you are part of. Think about that. You can't know what to do unless you know what story you are part of. It is important to this community to know Fredericksburg's story and to ensure that the story is told and to ensure that the generations behind that come behind us will know it as well. The Civil Rights Trail and its remarkable wealth of history captured at each one of the sites, thanks to those who were here present and not present who shared their stories with us. This trail is part of our determination to tell the story of Fredericksburg so that we do know what to do going forward. I can close without a huge thank you to our wonderful city staff led by Victoria Matthews. And to Chris Williams of the, of the UMW team. A dynamic duo, believe me, who have seen this project through from its inception. We mark today another step forward on the path to freedom and that struggle to create a more perfect union. Thank you so very much for joining us. Thank all of you for your participation. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Greenlaw. First, I would like to express my gratitude to Victoria Matthews yeah. uh, for being here for another hand. <laughs> she was the one who contacted me uh, during the summer of 2020 to start this journey of telling the story of the civil rights experience here in the city of Fredericksburg. Second, I want to thank the legendary people in the front row, in the front two rows, for their time, their wisdom, and their kindness while interviewing them for this endeavor. I have gained a wealth of knowledge about their tragedies and triumphs during segregation and desegregation. Although I'm a native of Spotsylvania County, I spent my formative years here in the city of Fredericksburg. I was a participant in the James Farmer Scholars Program and the Upper Bound Program. Both programs have foundational ties to civil rights movement icons, Dr. James Farmer and Reverend C.T. Vivian. While growing up, I used to attend many of the cultural activities 
here in the city of Fredericksburg due to my mother's involvement with several organizations such as Harambe 360. Shout out to Miss Kate. <laughs> and many others. So I thought I knew most of the black history here in the city of Fredericksburg. But after I embarked on this journey with Victoria, I found out and realized I hardly knew anything. I want to be clear when I say this. I cannot overstate the importance of knowing your history and for others to know it. Because black history is American history. That's right. Uh, there is only one civil rights trail in the Commonwealth of Virginia. It is located in Farmville. There are other civil rights movement sites in the Commonwealth. Our hope is that this will become the second right. civil rights trail in the Commonwealth. And again, there are not enough words to express how this project has impacted. Now, I would like to introduce to you my friend Victoria Matthews, tourism sales manager for the city of Fredericksburg, the Department of Economic Development and Tourism, and my partner on this project to, to tell you how this project came about and to show you the, the reason why we're all here today, Victoria. <laughs> Wow, usually I'm the one in the, who sets the room up and then gets the heck out of the room and lets other people do all the talking. So this is a little bit new for me today, but I'm so grateful for each and every one of you being here today. Thank you, Mr. Williams. <laughs> I appreciate you so very much. Wanted to tell you a little bit about how this uh, idea came to be. After attending an industry trade show and seeing the unveiling of the U.S. Civil Rights Trail in 2017, I wanted to find out about Fredericksburg's civil rights story. After participating with the James Farmer Multicultural Center in 2019 on a trip to follow the journey of the 1961 Freedom Rides, I connected with Mr. Williams in July 2020 to see about partnering with us on the city of Fredericksburg Civil Rights Trail. The result is what you will see here today. Do no harm was the motto that Mr. Williams and I established for this project. We knew that this was a serious, potentially triggering topic, and we wanted to treat these stories with the care, dignity, respect, and trust that this project required. As the first step for this project, we collected oral histories. We needed to find out what happened in Fredericksburg to find out what to focus the trail on. Mr. Williams interviewed the participants to find out about their experiences in Fredericksburg. He had established relationships with and trust with many of those folks. And because of that, they allowed room for me, a representative of the city of Fredericksburg, an entity that had not always been seen in a positive light by the black community. Yeah. I thank them for their time and trust in sharing these stories with us and for allowing us into their homes, at their kitchen tables, and for working on the huge pile of paper needed for this project. <laughs> we have not changed any of these oral histories. You will hear stories and language that will be difficult, and that includes the use of the N-word. This is necessary to have an understanding of what these folks were put through. The next step was to have these interviews transcribed, choose quotes, and then placed into UMW archives. We wanted the oral histories to be available to students and community members in perpetuity. We, with the help of UMW students, then identified sites of significance and started collecting photos, which are really hard to find. If you have any that you're willing to share, you can get my email address and we'll get that taken care of. Dr. Henry used our project as part of a historic preservation curriculum. Dr. Devlin and Mr. Williams oversaw other interns who worked on this project. 
What we are going to show you today is the GIS story map that we have created. The narrative was written by myself and Mr. Williams. The story map was built by Dr. Steve Hanna. He is the UMW geography professor and he worked with the UMW geography students and some of which are in the room today. We then transferred this over to the city of Fredericksburg and thank you our IT, Emily from IT, for transferring that over. You have the printed piece that will be handed out at the visitor center. This is what we will be giving visitors when they come in. It includes the narrative and maps. Also included in that brochure, you will see a QR code that you can scan with your phone. You can do that now and you can follow along with us. There is a form to fill out in the front of that notebook as well. If you would like to sign up for a tour, we will be offering free tours of the Civil Rights Trail, probably uh, several different ones. So just give us your information and we'll be sure to reach out to you. So let's show you the Civil Rights Trail. Could I get the house lights dim, please? <coughs> Emily will be scrolling through while I'll be keeping pace, so we'll see. Let's get her, get, let's do this. Um, first off, this picture shown at the top of the trail was taken at the unveiling of the Walker Grant Historic Panel of the 1950 protest. This is one of the trail stops. The two men in that picture are William Knoll and Roger Williams. Mr. Knoll is here with us today and we are grateful for his presence. <laughs> to be missed is Reverend Hashimul Turner and he is with us here today as well. The, the tour starts at the Fredericksburg Visitor Center where visitors can review copies of the Green Book, pick up information on the trail and proceed on their way. The trail is divided into two parts. Part one covers the downtown area about 2.6 miles with 12 stops and additional three more that visitors can add. Part two covers UMW and two sites closer to UMW on that side of town. Part two is half a mile on campus and 1.9 miles off campus. We have a total of 21 stops. Our trail covers 1865 to present day. And it's a walking tour, not done in chronological order, but in what made sense to walk the trail. So we're gonna start scrolling through the trail. Our first stop is Shiloh Baptist Church Old Site. This has been a cornerstone of the black community since 1815. Here we cover the different pastors that were at the church to include Reverend Dixon, who led several hundred black citizens on a march through Fredericksburg for Emancipation and Decoration Day. Reverend Hester, who focused on education, paying poll taxes, and writing the Shiloh Herald, and whose granddaughter, Ambassador Pamela Bridgewater, would later become a U.S. ambassador under Clinton, Bush, and Obama. All right. yeah. and. <laughs> ambassador Bridgewater provided an oral history about her grandfather, Reverend Hester. Reverend Davies was the pastor from Shiloh Baptist Church Old Site uh, from 1962 until 2012 who was also interviewed for this project, and he talks about what Fredericksburg was like when he arrived. Reverend Davies would go on to become the first black member of city council from 1966 to 1976, and the first black mayor from 1976 to 1996. Unfortunately, Reverend Davies and his wife could not join us today. We hope they are watching on Facebook Live. Here's Reverend Davies, right here, as well. Uh, stop number two is, Johnny P, is the Johnny P. Johnson mural. Mr. Johnson passed away on November 5th, 2022, which was a tremendous loss for this community. He was a teacher at Walker Grant and would go on to make history as the first black professor at Mary Washington College, now University. The story he shared with us about what happened in Fredericksburg was when Martin Luther King was assassinated. 
Here you can see where we were able to embed a video of Johnny Johnson. We're going to play that video for you now. You know, I get inspiration from a lot of things. And believe it or not, I enjoy painting as much now as I ever have. 1959, I got a call from the person in charge of personnel hiring and so forth at Virginia State College where I went. Uh, and they said, well, you have a job in Fredericksburg, got the job with the idea that I would paint, save money, paint, save money. <laughs> and after about two years or three years, I would take my money and go to New York and go to, to the village uh, and turn the art world upside down. <laughs> Along comes Jean, working down the hall. She was a fourth grade teacher. Fell in love, that was the end of uh, <laughs> turning the art world upside down. <laughs> Teaching and inspiring young people and now a lot of old ones that I teach at the community center has always been a higher priority in my life than, than painting. I'm very proud to, to, to be in Fredericksburg. I mean, we have some really talented artists, very creative people, and I think the community is more receptive to the idea that art has meaning. Moving on to the next uh, stop. The next stop covers the sit-in movement during the summer of 1960 to desegregate lunch counters and movie theaters. Protests were held at F.W. Woolworth's store, W.T. Grant's store, the Victoria Movie Theater, and People's Drug Store. Gaytag Agdegbalola, who is here with us today, and her mother Gladys Poltava. <laughs> Tareen Mercer McConnell were all involved in these protests. A quote from John White describes his experience jumping on a, school, on a stool at five years old before the lunch counters were desegregated. It did not go well. <laughs> Moving on to the Fredericksburg Area Museum, we also wanted to make sure the trail was accessible for those with mobility issues. <coughs> Here you can see if you have mobility issues that you need to stay on William Street and not walk up Market Square. We noted that with the hashtag of green and white. This museum now houses the slave auction block with a new exhibit, a monumental weight. The auction block in Fredericksburg, Virginia that was done by Dr. Gayla Sims, curator of African American history and special projects at the Fredericksburg Area Museum. Please visit this exhibit when the museum opens on March 1st. Dr. Sims is with us today. The next tour stop is at the slave auction block. This is the site in 1850, 1854, where 43 enslaved people were sold for $26,000. This site has a temporary installation Dr. Sims will be working on that site over the next couple of years for a more complete interpretation. Our next stop 
is Liberty Town. Liberty Town tells the story of Henry Dean, a black entrepreneur who was born into slavery, a valet to a grand wizard in the Ku Klux Klan, who would later, after the Civil War, go on to build housing for the black community in Liberty Town. Liberty Town was considered at the time to be an undesirable part of Fredericksburg during Jim Crow. We discuss Jim Crow in this section and share oral histories by John White and Robert Christian. The Colored Cemetery at Potter Field is our next stop. Uh, this stop had the remains of enslaved and free blacks that were, remo were removed to make room for Maury School, an all-white school in 1920. The school was named for Matthew Fontaine Maury, a general in the Confederate Army. We're scrolling, hold on. <laughs> the picture you see here is of a 12-year-old boy in front of Maury School taken by the Freelance Star on September 4th, 1962, for an article on desegregating the school. The student was not identified. Robert Christian would desegregate that school in 1962. He is here with us today. <laughs> were placed on the properties as a result. It is here where we discuss some of the black neighborhoods of Fredericksburg and Reverend Turner's oral history on his experience in Mayfield, another black community is here. On the second story of the National Bank building, John Washington lived as an enslaved boy. His room is still located in the building. After the Civil War, he escaped across the Rappahannock River and seven years later wrote his memories as an enslaved person in Fredericksburg. There are very few written histories from the enslaved themselves, so his memories are really critical to understanding what happened in Fredericksburg to an enslaved person. And there's John Washington right there. The next stop is the Fredericksburg Jail. Throughout our trail, we connected events happening here with events happening on a national level for context. At this site, we discussed lynchings. The first case involved Paul Key, who was hung in the city of Fredericksburg in 1889. He was convicted by an all-white jury for assaulting a six-year-old white girl. He professed his innocence until the day he was hung. This story is one of several hundred that have the same circumstances around it that are likely not true. The second case in Fredericksburg was an attempted lynching of Charles Blanford in 1904. The authorities were able to stop that one from happening. There are no further case notes to know what happened to Mr. Blanford. We don't, we don't know what happened to him. The next stop is the Fredericksburg Fire Department currently sits on what was the site of the former Greyhound Trailways bus station and the first stop on the Freedom Rides from Washington, D.C. in 1961. On May 4th, 1961, the original 13 Freedom Riders would stop in Fredericksburg to attempt to desegregate interstate public transportation before continuing to Anniston, Alabama, where they would be met by the Ku Klux Klan beaten, and their bus was firebombed. Dr. James Farmer orchestrated the Freedom Ride. He would later become a professor, of, <coughs> professor at Mary Washington College, now University. There is a Freedom Rides Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. They are watching us today on Facebook live feed, and we thank them for their interest in Fredericksburg. <laughs> Mr. Williams, Dion Diamond, who was the Freedom Rider who came down for our event in September of 2021, myself, and Frank White, 
who unfortunately could not be with us today, but has been so helpful on this trail, and I thank him very, very much. Stock 12 is Shiloh Baptist Church new site. This was, church was also a cornerstone of the black community with her efforts in the civil rights movement. It focused on education, community service, and activism, and established the first black school in Fredericksburg. In this section, we talk about Dr. Urbane Bass, who arrived in Fredericksburg in 1906. He would have no privileges at Mary Wa to practice medicine at Mary Washington Hospital, and despite that, chose to go fight in World War I, where he was fatally wounded. He is buried at the Fredericksburg Spotsylvania National Military Park next to his wife. The two hotels for black visitors were also located next to and across the street from Shiloh Baptist Church Old Site, the Hotel McGuire, and the Hotel Rappahannock. Oral histories were provided by Reverend Turner and Russell Brown about businesses in those areas. We also have nine seconds of video for the Hotel McGuire sign, which we think was on Route 1. Go ahead. You can see a car going behind it, and you can see some movement of it. Uh, the city of Fredericksburg now owns this video. This was also the area that Charles Dyson, Fredericksburg's first black police officer, had his patrol. And because of segregation laws at the time, he was unable to arrest white people. <laughs> he owned businesses and created the first all-black baseball team. Charles Dyson would be sent to Vietnam and lose his life. He is buried at Arlington Cemetery. Is his brother here today, Jimmy Dyson? for 50 years and played a role in removing racial barriers from at Mary Washington Hospital. There is uh, Dr. Ellison on the right and Urbane Bass is on the left. You can also walk to the Urbane Bass grave site at the Fredericksburg Spotsylvania National Military Park. Uh, his wife is, near, uh, is laid to rest next to him, and her name was Maud, and they're right next to each other on the bottom row as you go into the cemetery. The third stop that you can walk to is the Walker Grant School, which was named in honor of Joseph Walker and Jason Grant. This was the first publicly supported black school in Fredericksburg until 1962. Here we have histories from Roland Moore, who attended Walker Grant, and who would later go on to desegregate James Monroe High School. Roland Moore, are you here with us today? Yes. So that is part one. So now we're going to talk about part two, and I'm going to hand it back over to Mr. Williams to cover the first four stops on that trail, which are on the university campus. back. <laughs> so part two, uh, we start the trail uh, with the background of the desegregation of University of Mary Washington, then Mary Washington College. It includes the story of my cousin Gladys White Jordan, who was denied admission in 1956. Even with the support of the college president at the time, she was still not admitted. She graduated from Walker Grant High School, um, and she was unable to attend the college. And she would go on to attend Virginia State College in Petersburg and become a high school social studies teacher. Her brother, Frank White, provided this story to us. The first black residential student to attend Mary Washington College 
was Kay Savage. And we are very fortunate to have her here today. Ms. Savage, can you please? stop on the trail is Combs Hall. A Combs Hall was formerly the science building. It is where the story of the Big Five is told. The Big Five were Orita Whitehead, Anita Whitehead, Christiana Holmes, Christiana Hall Worthens, um, Claudia Dottie Holmes, and Venus Jones. These five women refer to themselves as the Big Five in honor of the Big Four of the Civil Rights Movement when they were students here on this campus. They were barrier breakers, and today we hold them in high regard here on this campus. Uh, there is a, uh, a depiction of Venus Jones dedicated to her in the Jepson Alumni Center as uh, Jepson Science Center building here on campus. Uh, the next stop is the James Farmer Memorial. Dr. James Farmer was one of the big six of the Civil Rights Movement, and he was the founder of the Congress of Racial Equality Corps and leader of the Freedom Rides in 1961. In 1985, he became a professor here at the University of Mary Washington, then Mary Washington College. And in 1998, he was selected as a recipient of the Presidential Medal Freedom Award. Um, I had the honor of attending that ceremony as a James Farmer Scholar, and that's something that I will never forget. And it is the highest honor a civilian can achieve in this country. The next stop is the James Farmer Multicultural Center. Um, I'm fortunate to work there. Um, it was created in 1990 in response to several racial incidents on campus. Um, cultural programs were created to expand the knowledge and enrichment for UMW students, staff, and faculty. Under the leadership of Forrest Parker, the center grew to highlight different ethnicities and identity groups and celebrate their histories. Today, the center has a robust schedule of programming that is open to the public and numerous initiatives to enlighten the campus community on inclusion, diversity, and social justice. The fourth stop is Monroe Hall. Monroe Hall is the oldest UMW academic building, and classes were taken there by Claudia Dottie Holmes. It is in this section where we discuss Mary Washington students, faculty, and staff activism with an article of Mary Washington students supporting the protests in Selma, Alabama, and mourning the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in Ball Circle. And Mrs. Matthews will continue the trail from here. is Shiloh Cemetery. Shiloh Cemetery is the finding rest resting place of many influential black citizens in, Fredericks in Fredericksburg. Joseph Walker, Jason Grant, Reverend B. Hester, the pa pastor at Shiloh Baptist Church Old Site, Reverend M. L. Murchison, pastor at Shiloh Baptist Church New Site. This is also the site where the free blacks and enslaved people's graves were moved to make room for the, for the all white school. A White Maury School. Our final stop on our Civil Rights Trail is the Dorothy Hart Community Center. 
On February 10, 2022, the city of Fredericksburg unveiled a historical historic panel about the Walker Grant High School class of, 19, of the 1950 protest. The protest stemmed from the city of Fredericksburg's refusals, refusal to provide the community building to the graduating class of 1950 due to the color of their skin. Only then later to allow them to use the building by entering the side door. The front door was off limits. The students were angered by the city's response. As a result, they protested and held their graduation at Shiloh Baptist Church Old Site. I want you to think about how brave these students were in June of 1950, 18 years old. This event predates Emmett Till's murder, the Montgomery bus boycott by five years and the March in Selma by 10. When, as I said earlier, one of those protesters is here with us today, Mr. William Knoll. We are so grateful for, grateful for Mr. Knoll and we appreciate him. On that walk of <laughs> On that Walker Grant panel is a QR code that allows you to listen to the recording of Ms. Sproul, who was also a Walker Grant graduate who protested that day. It is her voice that you hear and her story from that QR code. Is Sonny Holmes with us today? Yes. There he is. My other good friend. I want to thank you, Mr. Holmes, for bringing that story to my attention. There was such a sense of urgency to get that panel into the ground. Mr. Holmes would call me and say, Victoria, we've lost another one. We need to get this panel in the ground. We took that project from start to finish with a committee four months, got it into the ground in four months. And I thank you, Mr. Holmes, for that. That is the trail. from the community and hopefully bring more stories forward. We are losing members of our community who were alive during this time period and it's so important to capture their stories before they are lost forever. We already need to finish transcribing a few interviews including a recent one from Kay Savage. We have all the oral histories in an audio format and we want to add these to the online trail so you can hear the voices of the participants, not just read their words. Mr. Williams will, be also, will also be recording the entire narrative so that the visually impaired visitors or folks who just prefer it that way can have an audio version of the trail. In addition to the story map and a printed PDF version that will live on fxbg.com, we are also adding this to a Trapes app that, we'll use for other, that we use for other walking tours. I will be creating a condensed version of this for the motor coach industry. I also wanna see if we can get the trail or some aspect, aspect of it on the US Civil Rights Trail and the Virginia Civil Rights Trail. We are already in discussions with Virginia Tourism Cooperation as we will need their assistance and support in getting that done. Representatives from Virginia Tourism Cooperation are here today. <laughs> Finally, I would like to make this a regional project to include the Ralph Bunch School in King George County. John J. Wright School in Spotsylvania. <laughs> the Loving Story in Caroline County. 
and the Rouser Building in Stafford County. We are really excited to share with you that we are getting a new state historical marker on John Washington. This will be more, there will be more information forthcoming about the marker. Thank you to the team involved in that project. Mr. Williams, he's involved in everything. Uh, Dr. Christine Henry, where are you? Kate Schwartz from City Planning. Kate, I saw you. John Hennessy, are you here today with us? And MC Morris, who is the Director of Tourism for City Planning. <laughs> Assistant Director, I'm sorry, MC, I just promoted you. Yay! <laughs> I would also like to thank City Council for the funds for that uh, historical marker. With this new addition, that makes a total of six new Black History signs in the City of Fredericksburg since December 20th. I want to leave you, in part on you, how important this project is for the City of Fredericksburg. We have got to keep this work going and this trail is the beginning of that. Thank you. I would just like to take a moment to recognize everyone that provided oral histories for this trail. Ambassador Pamela Bridgewater, Reverend Lawrence A. Davies, Johnny P. Johnson, John White, Frank White, Robert Christian, Reverend Ashmill Turner, Mr. Russell Brown, Roland Moore, Ms. Gay Agdek Malola, and Ms. Marguerite Young. Can we please give them a standing ovation? Next, I would like to invite Dr. Steve Hanna, Professor of Geography and AAG Cartography Editor at the University of Mary Washington to explain the GIS system used for this project and contribution of the UMW students involved with it. saying how grateful I am that Victoria and Chris brought me into work and to assist them on this trail. In my career, I've seldom had more rewarding experiences than assisting two smart, dedicated, passionate people engage in a work as consequential as creating a civil rights trail in the city of Fredericksburg. in the spring of 2021, they asked me to recruit some students to prepare maps for the trail. That summer, John Liberty, could you stand up, John? Yes. <laughs> John began assembling the geographic data we would need, building footprints, streets, preliminary tour routes, stops, um, into a GIS database, and then prepared a few preliminary maps that helped Chris and Victoria visualize parts of the trail and finalize their routes. In fall 2021, Brooke Prevedel joined the team. Uh, 
Brooks is the principal designer of the printed maps that you'll find tucked into the back of the trail booklet. Brooks chose the color palette, fonts, and symbols that she and John used to create the final maps that you see for both parts one and part two of the trail. That next spring, 2022, Josie Alande and Anis Malangu. <laughs> They join the team to create the online version of the trail map that you have just seen. This uses ESRI's story map interface, and using that, Anais, Josie, and John combined the map data that we had already collected with Chris and Victoria's narrative, edited some of the photographs and videos that they provided, and built the first draft of Freedom, a work in progress. This story map we hope will guide people through Fredericksburg, both walking and sitting maybe at home, and will help them locate some of the most important stories of our city's history. As President Paino never tires of explaining, this is what we strive to do at Mary Washington. Faculty, staff, and students engage with community partners to complete works of consequence, projects that make a difference here in Fredericksburg and across the globe. Now, as I said a moment ago, the stories comprising this trail are among the most important in Fredericksburg's history. They are Fredericksburg's history. Yet for far too long, these stories were not given a place in the public square. This meant that too many people remained ignorant of the tragedies black people faced, the barriers they broke, and the triumphs they realized in the struggle for freedom and justice. That struggle continues and therefore the trail designed to make that struggle visible remains a work in progress, as both Victoria and Chris have mentioned. And finally, while the maps prepared by Anais, Josie, John, and Brooke tell us where moments of this struggle occurred, the maps themselves will not attach the civil rights struggle to the sites. To make this happen, people, brochure or phone in hand, have to walk this trail and share their experiences on it with others. I certainly hope that you all will. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hammond. Uh, can we give a round of applause for the students who worked on this afternoon? Senator Tim Kaine to give a few remarks. So, good afternoon to all. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. To, to, to Chris and Victoria, I see why the mayor called you the dynamic duo. Absolutely. Um, to the Fredericksburg community, the Mary Washington community, what a day during Black History Month to really celebrate something powerful. I have many staff with me, including uh, two interns, one who's a UMW student, one who's a Germana College student, staffers from my local office just down the hill and also from DC, because we all wanted to come and learn today. My staff knows that I usually don't speak from notes, but that doesn't mean I'm not prepared. Usually I prepare <laughs> in my head and speak from my heart, but today I didn't prepare because Chris, the point you made about not knowing the history. I live in Richmond, not Fredericksburg. I was a civil rights lawyer for 18 years before I got into local life. And in Richmond, I've dealt with a lot of our civil rights history, but I didn't know the Fredericksburg history. Right. And so what I decided to do was to not prepare, but to watch and learn and then react. And so if you will let me just react from the heart, based upon what I've seen as Chris and Victoria walked us through the trail. I like that it's a trail, not a site, not a set of sites, not a memorial. 
I like that it's a trail because everyone in this room is on a journey and Fredericksburg is on a journey and Virginia is on a journey and America is on a journey and humanity is on a journey. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you've called these important sites trail reminds us that we're on a journey. What are lessons that we learn on a journey, the journey of the sites that were displayed? Pain is real. Progress is possible. The work isn't done. We all have a part. I know you've all noticed that we're in a big fight in this country about whether we can be honest about our history or not. So some believe if you accurately talk about the reality of pain, you're doing that to make people feel bad or people feel guilty. That's not, that's not true. That you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Pain is a reality. And pain is a reality for everyone. Pain is a reality for everyone but it's not equally shared by everyone. Everyone knows pain of one kind or another, but pain is not equally shared by everyone. And we cannot be mortal and sinful people without acknowledging pain. But that's not the end of the story. It, it might be the beginning of the story, but it's not the end of the story. Progress is possible. The stories that we've heard and that we've watched were about people living in painful situations, the pain of discrimination or slavery, oppression, the pain of war, which has affected Fredericksburg more than most, but unwilling to accept pain as the sole definition of their reality, progress is possible. Thank God that progress is possible. Is, some people, they, they don't want to acknowledge, for example, that you know the Constitution had slavery in it, but if progress wasn't possible, life wouldn't be worth living. Right. We, we could look back and see that we're better than some came before us, but we ought to want those who come after us to look back at us and realize that they've gone farther than we have gone. If progress isn't possible, what's the point? Mm -hmm. And the stories along the trail teach us that lesson, that while we may be at pain at a beginning point, progress is possible. The work isn't done. The work isn't done. We, we can celebrate progress. I'll, I'll just give you an example from this week. When I came into the Senate in 2013, of the 11 members of Congress of Virginia, precisely zero were women. All right, now. This week, four of the 11 are women. This was in 10 years. There had never been an African-American woman elected to Congress from Virginia. That ended in a special election on Tuesday yeah. night. Yeah. So we can celebrate progress, but we can't pat ourselves on the back and say the work is done because it isn't. Because we would look all around us in Fredericksburg and Richmond and Virginia in the country and the world and see pain still exists, progress is still necessary. And then the last re reaction to this is the work is up to all of us. There's, there's, I guess there's a theory of history that's sort of like the great man theory of history and an awful lot of history books are written and they pick a, f a few figures <laughs> and maybe recently we've done a better job of trying to diversify the, the stories of the figures that we tell. And yet it's not just on the shoulders of the few. I mean, if, if you're going to go from pain to progress and then continue the work that needs to be done, it's never just on the shoulders of the few. It's on the shoulders of, of everyone. Some of the people whose stories were told, I knew your mayor, Mayor Davies, because he was like the mayor's mayor when, when I was running for city council in Richmond in 1994. Already he was, you know, a, a, a scene around Virginia, sort of like the mayor's mayor. So. Among the stories that were told, there were some stories of people who are pretty widely known, but there are also some stories of those who might not have been so widely known, and there's stories still to tell of those who aren't. None of us are exempt from the responsibility of taking 
the realities of pain and being empathetic to others' pain and trying to move toward progress. And we should never assume that progress can only be made by people with titles or degrees. Sometimes help comes from the most unlikely source and wisdom comes from the place you least expect it. And that's one of the beauties of life. And that is something that I see as I watch the presentation today. So um, I just congratulate the community for having this conversation. So often, you know, one thing begets a conversation that becomes about a million things. So the debate about what to do with the auction block begetted a set of conversations that has led to this and, and led to relationships and friendships and deeper knowledge and a commitment to take it even farther. I'm even struck as I conclude my own journey. I, I inhabit a Senate seat that was inhabited for about 50 years by Harry Bloodbird Jr. and Harry Bird III. And they were two of the architects of massive resistance to integration. They were two of the most prominent users of Senate tools like the filibuster to block civil rights legislation from being passed. And thinking about the birds in the seat I now sit in makes me think about even the journey that this Senate seat is on but how much further I still have to go and we have to go. So thank you for encouraging me in that way and congratulations to all of you for coming together to do something so beautiful. Thank you, Senator Kane, for your remarks. Um, Next person to come up to the podium. Uh, we recently found out that we have some connection uh, relative-wise. Um, my good friend, Vice Mayor Chuck Fry. Charlie was right here in Fredericksburg. Right. 
So I always said, you know, I would hear these stories at the, at, the, at the table, at the dinner table about the world. Like, man, I can't wait to go see the world. Um, when I, right around the time when I was taking uh, civics um, in high school in the city, my both parents uh, became ill. And uh, long story short, I didn't get a chance to travel the world. I was like, hey, I need to do whatever I can to help out at home. I want to say that to say this. I'm happy that I'm here. I'm happy that I'm the son of the city. And for, for my fellow council members, there were a lot of conversations um, that we had during the slave auction block. And I do remember just kind of repeating myself about different things. So I, I, I want to say um, I was uplifted by a lot of people in this room doing the slave block you know, ordeal, I would call it. Um, it was voted down in the beginning, um, six to one. We turned that around months later, six to one to get it out of here, and which we put it in, in a museum. But that journey is is part of the reason why we're here today. That's right. So you know the the courage the, the courage that I had it it wasn't me. A lot of times uh, when I was speaking on things, it wasn't me talking. It was all of this information that I was hearing from you know, the dining room table, the living room table. It was all of this information. It was all of these names. And I was like, you know, a lot of times I would look around and say, where's this coming from? But it was coming from my grandma Pearl's kitchen table. It was coming from my mom. It was coming from going to my mom Pearl's house on Charles Street, going by the slave block. It was all of these things that were just pouring out of me and I couldn't stop it. So um, the fact that, that we're here today and Little Charlie is not more or less telling the story of, of history in the city because I don't know the story of the history, right? I just know what folks told me. So in this whole thing of, of telling stories, it's, it's the kitchen table conversations. It's such and such grandparent or such and such uncle. It's those stories that, that, that are important that we get out and then also, there are some times where you get the story of two or three, right? And this is like your core, right? So if you take 100 folks and you tell five stories, you're, not, you're missing 95 stories. So for me to be a representative, I want to say that I'm, that I'm, I'm proud. Um, I'm proud, very proud to be a representative. Um, uh, to, I, grew up in, in, uh, I grew up in Anita Scott's house with her sons. Never knew this story. I never knew this story. I'm gonna say it again. I grew up in Anita Scott's house. She was she was one of the ones, you know, at, at the University of Mary Washington. I never knew the story. Um, today, I was I, I, I was kind of mesmerized by the picture of uh, Mr. Christian standing there at Mark. And I came in today. I saw Bryce. I said, Bryce, you remember me? Bryce and my sisters they went to school together. And, and uh, his brother Marcellus, we used to shoot ball together. I never knew these stories, never knew these stories. So I want to say as a representative that I am proud that the city is telling the story. All right. Right? So the city is speaking. And we're documenting everything and it's done the right way. Um, to have the university to partner with the city is, is very, very, very important. Um, right. To have the students, you know, I'm pretty sure for the students, you looked at it as probably extra credit, maybe, <laughs> hey, <laughs> get around the city, maybe we go to Benny's Pizza and write a little bit more, right? <laughs> um, and I'm sure now, after you guys have engaged in everything that's going on here, that you learned so much that you'll take back home, you know, to, to wherever you guys are from, if you don't stay here. Um, so I'm proud of, of, of the city of Fredericksburg, and that's, that's really what I want to leave with today. Um, I know that we're a leader, you know, every, Every elected official says something great about their city, right? But I know that we're a leader um, because it's proof when, when, uh, when, when the movement happened of Black Lives Matter a couple years ago. It's proof because we were already working on social issues and it started before those type of situations. So when folks were coming to Fredericksburg talking about what was going on around us, it wasn't Fredericksburg because we were already working on these stories and we were open and honest enough to say, hey, and then I got to see, you know, folks look at somebody that they grew up with and say, hey, I didn't know you felt that way. 
I am so sorry. And, and folks will say, hey, you don't have to apologize, but this is our reality. So now our reality is now open for everybody to understand why we are certain ways and the fact that we can come together and and, and, should, and pay homage to the folks that, that made it happen. Um, my parents couldn't vote in the city of Fredericksburg, right? And and I'm, I'm the only African-American representative in the city of Fredericksburg. Right. So that's a story within itself, right? The fact that my parents couldn't, couldn't do something that I'm able to stand here and be productive at it and almost do it with a little bit of attitude. <laughs> <laughs> And, and you guys should be ashamed of yourself for clapping for me having a little bit of attitude. I tell, I'll, leave, I'll leave on this note. The mayor and I, the mayor and I have a lot of uh, great conversations. And, and we, were, we were somewhere one day, and uh, I leaned in, I, I tapped her. Hey, I'm, I'm tired of this song. And, uh, and you know, Mayor Greenlaw kind of looked at me. And I said, you know, every time I turn around, we sing this song, We Shall Overcome. And, and for me, it's a timepiece that puts us in a timepiece, right? So um, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a lot of musicians. I'm, I'm looking at one right now, but I'm not gonna say a name. But somebody should come up with, with a song, uh, We Have Overcame, because if we keep singing the song of the old, right, we're gonna stick in one spot. And, and in order for us you know, to get past some things, we have to say, okay, we've been there, we're gonna pay tribute to the folks that did that. And now we got to show the next level. And I think that uh, I think that's where we are in, in, the, in the city of Fredericksburg. And um, I look forward to doing more projects and at the next event, because I know it'll be more. Um, I'll come as Vice Mayor Fry and I'll, I'll leave little Charlie at home. So thank you. <laughs> a couple of folks today who are not expecting this, but we're going to do that. Emily, will you grab, um, pull, the, pull the drape off the table. <laughs> um, I would like to ask Dr. Hannah, Senator Kane, Mayor Greenlaw, Vice Mayor Fry, to please stand in front of the screen. Emily, will you please pass the award uh, to Mayor Greenlaw, please? We present this award to Dr. Stephen Hanna, PhD, Professor of Geography, University of Mary Washington, in appreciation for your GIS contribution to the city of Fredericksburg Civil Rights Trail, Freedom, a Work in Progress. John, Josephine, Anais, and Brooke, I put some thought into what I could do for the four of you. The best thing that I can do for the four of you is provide you with the City of Fredericksburg letter thanking you for your efforts as a PDF to include in your portfolios and for your resumes moving forward. We will get those to you in the next couple of weeks. Are we good? Okay. I would like to ask Dr. Henry to join Senator Kane, Mayor Greenlaw, and Vice Mayor Friday Kane. We present this award to Dr. Christine Henry, PhD, Associate Professor and Director of of the Center for Historic Preservation Department at UMW. In appreciation for your work on the Freedom Rider and John Washington State Markers and contributions on the City of Fredericksburg Civil Rights Trail, Freedom, a work in progress. You're up, Mr. Williams. Come on now. Get up, let's go.
And finally, we present this award to Christopher Williams, Assistant Director, James Farmer Multicultural Center, University of Mary Washington, in appreciation for your outstanding partnership, leadership, and contribution to the City of Fredericksburg Civil Rights Trail, Freedom, a Work in Progress. to him to say thank you for his partnership, collaboration, and friendship for the last two and a half years. What a great guy to have during COVID. <laughs> Go ahead. So we're presenting, I'm presenting today to Mr. Williams an art piece. These are, these are reproduction prints of art done by Leroy Brown. It is currently on display in the Fredericksburg Visitor Center. is the EDT staff at the uh, Fredericksburg Economic, where do I work? Fredericksburg Economic <laughs> Development and Tourism. I thank them for their help with the brochure and the work that they've done today and the website work. So I thank our staff for that. Uh, Chris, put your stuff back down. You're on. Thank y'all for bearing with me. All right. Uh, to conclude the program this evening, um, I think it's appropriate uh, that we all can stand. Um, when you all arrived this afternoon, you all received a copy of Good Every Voice and Sing, a song written by James Weldon Johnson and Rosemont Johnson at the turn of the 20th century. Um, Alex, um, can you leave <coughs> Oh, 